I'm just here to declare some things tonight. Psalms 102, verse 13, the year of the upgrade. How many of you need an upgrade? How many of you need a shift up? You can downshift, but how many of you know that there are times where you need an upgrade? Amen. Sometimes it's time to trade in that past for something new. And new wine is coming. You will arise and have mercy on Zion for the time of favor. Somebody say favor. favor. Is on us. Yes, the set time has come. Heavenly Father, anoint this word tonight. I must decrease and you must increase, Lord. Set at liberty the captives tonight. Win the loss tonight. Break the religious chains off people who are in bondage and blind to the kingdom tonight. Shift people upward tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. We'll also be in Matthew chapter 9 and Luke chapter 5. The message really begins with something Jesus said, that you can't put new wine into an old wine skin. Wine in those days was put in animal skins. That was part of the fermentation process and as the wine would ferment, the animal skins would stretch and they would stretch to the degree that they couldn't hold the new wine. Jesus would also say that no one really asks for the new wine that's used to drinking the old wine. You know, no one knows what a Big Mac tastes like till they've had one. Amen? You know, if you've never experienced kingdom, you won't know what you're missing. If you've never been filled with the Holy Ghost, you won't know what you're missing. If your whole life's three points in a poem and go to the house, that's, that's all you'll long for in the Christian world. A good Sunday school program, a good program for this and a good program for that and let's play church and dress up and nobody gets saved. Nobody uh, labors in prayer all night. No, nobody cries when they're worshiping Jesus. Let's just have church and be little worldlings. As I said, we're moving in, in the Jewish calendar, the year of the open door. May I teach just a moment? Yes, we're moving from 5783 in the Jewish calendar to 5784. This is the Jewish New Year this past weekend, Rosh Hashanah. Five is the number of grace, my favorite word in the Bible. What my whole ministry is based on is grace. Everybody say grace. grace. Many of us need grace. And those of you who don't need grace, you're just lying and you need it double. <laughs> In the Hebrew al alphabet, hey or hey, H-E-I, means to look or behold. Mystics say it's the divine breath or word of God. Five also represents the Torah. God's standards go hand in hand with his grace. Next, we have the number seven, which is the number of perfection completion, wholeness, and creation. In the Hebrew alphabet, it is Zion, and it can also mean a weapon, sword, or a crown. Eight, as many of us know, is the number of new beginnings, new order, new birth, new names. The Hebrew alphabet, Chet. It is the letter of life, but it's also the letter of sin symbolized by a fence or a wall of protection is what eight can mean. Sometimes a new beginning is not a good beginning. So you have to choose in the kingdom of God which kind of beginning you want. Eighty in the Hebrew alphabet is pay, P-E-Y, and it means breath of testimony. The Hebrew word for 80 is also a bok, dust. God is sending his spirit through those who were created and dedicated to his service like Samuel from the time they were little. Daniel interpreted Belshazzar's dream when he was 80 years old. Moses confronted Pharaoh at 80. God's doing something. Some of you about to turn 80 or just turned 80. You're, you're not done. There's a miracle and a new beginning for you. 
The number four is the number of creation. It's also the number of seasons that we have. We must understand, as it says in Ecclesiastes, that seasons change. For everything, there is a season. You may not like the season you're in, but understand that it will change. You will reap a harvest if you don't quit. Four, the number of creation, the number of seasons. Four also means divine appointments, favor, worship. There were four witnesses of God listed in the New Testament. Miracles, signs, wonders, and the gifts of the Spirit. How many days was Lazarus dead before Jesus said, come forth? Four. So what is God saying to us in the prophetic code of the Psalms? As I said, the Ascension Psalms, if you go back to Psalms 118 and you look at our 2018, leading through the pandemic, if you read each chapter of Psalms all the way to Psalms 134, it reads like front page news. You need to read them. It will blow your mind. Everything listed in Psalms 122 is what we just experienced in the kingdom as a remnant and even as an individual and as a church. It talked about being betrayed. It talked about a shaking. But the good news is, and that's what I want to focus on tonight, is the good news. Psalms 124 says this, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, can I get some praise? If it wasn't for the Lord, which represents in the Hebrew the face of Yahweh's favor turned towards us, we cried out for mercy, favor in Psalms 123, and his mercy and divine favor turned towards us. Now let Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us. How many of you have ever had anybody rise up against you? Rise up against there in the Hebrew means when enemy takes authority over us when he has no authority over us, when we allow him to overcome us or overwhelm us or take authority that he hasn't been granted by the Holy Spirit. They would have, but didn't. They would have swallowed us up, eaten us alive when their wrath was kindled against us. The fiery breath of their hate speech was coming out of their nostrils like flaming swords of antagonism. The waters would have overwhelmed us. They would have drowned us. The stream would have gone over our soul. The venom would have conquered us like a flood and drowned us. Then the swollen waves of the proud would have gone over our soul. But blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Praise the Lord, he did not assign us to be eaten alive. There was a purpose for what we went through. Our soul has escaped, verse seven. We've been rescued as a bird. Somebody say the Holy Spirit. Understand the devil always comes after a dove. You have a spiritual moment like what we experienced last night and even this morning, understand the devil always shows up after the dove. But you are about to enter into a new realm of revelation. So when the devil comes in and says, you ain't good enough, that was fake, that was phony, you're not gonna get your harvest. He's a liar, a murderer, and a thief. And he has no legal standing over your life. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken, shattered into pieces, and we have escaped. Our help, aid, confidence is in the name of the Lord, Yahweh Nisi, the Lord our banner, who made heaven and earth, creator Elohim there is the word used. Favor is the tangible evidence that you have the approval of God and you live conscious of God's presence and peace. I heard Bishop Jake say many years ago, favor ain't fair. And I'm here to tell you tonight, I'm not bragging on me, I don't understand it, but I walk in it. I mean, it's just not fair. I, I do, 
I'm blessed. My wife's blessed. My kids are blessed. I, I can't explain it. We go to an airport. We meet people we've always wanted to meet. We connect with heroes. I don't understand, but we work hard, and God blesses our seed. He blesses our marriage. He blesses our lives. My dad always gets mad about it. <laughs> Not really, but he picks at me about it. He says, I can preach on heaven and 10 people get mad. You preach on hell smiling. <laughs> but understand, there was a lot of pain to get to this portal. You don't know what it was like to be eight years old and to hear your dad being talked about on the news and bloody in your knuckles fighting in elementary schools in defense of your church and your family. You don't know what it was like to have the media attack you because they hated your dad. You don't know what it's like to be falsely accused. You don't know what it's like to have people speak against your kids, try to hurt your kids because they hate your church. You don't know what I've been through to get where I am. You don't know the feet I've washed to get where I am. You don't know the times I've had to keep my mouth shut when I wanted to say things to get where I am. You don't know the sins I've had to repent of to get to where I am. The apology letters I've had to write and the things I've had to lay at the feet of Jesus to get where I am. You don't know what I've been through. If you did, I promise you, you'd be okay with the favor that's on my life now. I live in conscious awareness of God's presence in my life. I live at peace. Sometimes my face may not show it because I have not learned that spiritual gift of how to fake my facial expressions. <laughs> if you say something stupid, I'm going to look at you stupid. If you do something stupid, I'm going to look at you stupid. If you tick me off, my face, which is red most of the time anyways, is going to get extra red. And I have a touch of autism and creative ADHD. If you catch me doing this, that means I'm trying to keep from punching you. <laughs> my wife will tell me, stop doing the hand thing. Stop doing the hand thing. Stop doing the hand thing, weirdo. Stop doing the hand thing. It's the Holy Ghost. We live in favor but we can increase in favor by faith and intimacy. Second Peter chapter one, verse two, favor and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, when we get revelation from the kingdom, favor comes. Favor increases for us with our knowledge of God. The closer I get to God, the more favor he puts on my life. This isn't a message on holiness, but you can't get closer to God without him transforming you. It may take some of you longer than others, but getting close to God is a transformational process. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a what? What does that creation word mean in the Greek? It means progressive change. I'm not as bad as I used to be, but I'm not as good as I'm gonna be. Kronos is a Greek word that refers to time. It speaks of minutes. Kairos, I've taught you this many times, speaks to moments, minutes and moments. If you want God's favor and you want his best for your life, you have to learn the difference between a minute and a moment. You have to learn how to step into the anointing in a moment. Paul would tell Timothy, be instant in season and out of season. What that means is when you see an opportunity to do something for Jesus Christ, say something for Jesus Christ, sing aloud for Jesus Christ, make a connection in the kingdom of God, you, you don't look at it as I'll do it in a minute. You look at it as I've got to take advantage of a moment. This is my moment. This may be my only shot. I've got to seize this moment. Kairos. 
Ephesians, Paul would tell us to be careful how we walk. He'd even use a word circumspectly, which means with wisdom. Uh, you can't walk with everybody. We're ambassadors of the kingdom. We're not supposed to look like everybody else. We're not supposed to talk like everybody else. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have friends. In fact, you need friends. You need godly covenants. You need the right relationships. But you can't walk with everybody. You can't talk to everybody about the inner workings of your spirit because the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. And some of you are in covenant with the natural man and it's hindering your spiritual man. So we must first understand that a prophecy has been released. Everybody say that with me. A prophecy has been released. This year, 5784 is a prophecy for all of us. What is the prophecy? The grace of God is bringing us into a new level of maturity, recreating us into his image, separating us from the past and bringing about a new beginning. This new beginning will be released by signs, wonders, miracles, and a fresh outpouring of the gifts of God's spirit. If you receive it, say amen. amen. 5780, 5781, 2019 at the, in the pandemic through 2021, God brought destruction and division in the natural body and the body of Christ. He allowed it. He allowed it because he wanted to see the, who the real true remnant was. 5782 represents an awakening, a year of faith. We had to rely on things that we knew not of. We had to have faith. There's nothing like pastoring this large church for three years and preaching to an empty building for six weeks, looking at a camera like this, going, good Lord, how are we gonna pay these bills? How am I gonna pay 36 people on payroll? I was here by myself because I didn't really abide by all that. Not because I was being rebellious, I just can't sit still. So I was here at church one day and one of our members, I was worried about the offering and I was in my office praying and one of our faithful members texted me and said, can I come by the church? I said, sure, if you're not scared of being around me, we're not supposed to be in close contact. It's the pandemic. He said, look, my grandkids and I watched the service online Sunday and I just want to bring a check for $25,000 over here to make sure all the bills were paid this week. My faith began to build. And as I said, this year of the upgrade, we've survived the snare of the fowler, the attacks of the enemy, the shaking. Now we're moving in to the year of the open door, new opportunities. It's happening, but you have to have eyes to see and ears to hear. 84 in, in strong concordance is Ebra, and it means the wing or a bird. Jacob was 84 when he made the deal with Laban for Rachel, but he got Leah instead. Anna was 84 when she as a widow had spent her life longing to see the Messiah, and she got to. Some of you have been praying about things forever, and God's about to bring them to pass. You've been praying for a grandchild, a child, a friend to come to Christ, to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You've been praying about it forever and ever and ever. You've, you've sown into it. It's coming to pass. In the next 12 months, it's coming to pass. God's gonna reach your loved ones. God's gonna shake you. God's gonna promote you. Everything you've believed God for in the past, it's coming. Believe it by faith. This is a prophecy of upgrade. God is upgrading you, your thought life. Let this mind be in Christ that was also in Christ Jesus. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. God's gonna teach you to start looking above what you see, living above your circumstances. See, you can't look at what's going on around you. You can't even trust what you hear around you these days. You better get a word from God and a word from heaven and you better get in a relationship with the king and understand you have access to everything that the king has. You have access to everything that the king has. Listen, I don't watch the news anymore I get my news from heaven I get my news from the word of God and you know what's happened since I stopped watching it 
I'm a better listener. I'm more understanding of people that I have differences with. God's given me new relationships, new perspective. His word is revealing itself in a fresh way because I've stopped allowing this demonic media to keep me from my destiny and to keep me from what God has for me. When we come into 2024, 2024, the battle is over. When you come into 2024 on our calendar, January, the battle is over. You're victorious. And prophetically speaking, you're gonna be tempted to celebrate the fall of the people that left you, hurt you, talked about you, bashed you. Don't fall for the bait of Satan. Pray for them. Bless those that curse you. But what you will see in the next 12 months is every voice that stood against you, you're going to see vindication. Every voice. Only three people agree with me. That's fine. I get my news from heaven. Every person that betrayed you, backstabbed you, put their mouth on you, as Bishop Ote would say, there's going to be some funerals. I don't wish that on anybody, but read your Bible. People think the unpardonable sin... It's suicide, it's not. It's putting your mouth on a move of God or a man of God. That's the unpardonable sin, quenching the Holy Spirit and putting your mouth on something you don't understand. The ecclesia, by 2024, the church, the remnant, those of us who've been called out, the ecclesia is coming into its own in the next three months. Every enemy will have been revealed. Everything will have been fully exposed and the victory will be ours. Amen. I believe it by faith. Isaiah 43, 19, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it will spring forth, but you will be aware of it. So we must understand that a prophecy has been released. When a prophecy is released, you can reject it or receive it. I receive it. Just say, I receive it. But I want to move next to a problem that Jesus revealed. A a prophecy and a problem. As I said, the devil always comes after the dove. In Matthew 9 and in Luke 5, after identifying Jesus as the Lamb of God, this wild radical named John the Baptist, he's found himself in prison. This man who is a devout Jew but a radical Jew longing for the Messiah, he recognized Jesus as the Lamb of God. He stood up for righteousness, he lived clean, he fasted every Monday and every Thursday. While he sat in prison, he started to question whether or not the one he identified as the Lamb of God was really the Lamb of God. John the Baptist, the forerunner to Jesus Christ, the one who baptized him, started going, listen, I'm hearing reports of this Jesus hanging out with wine bibbers. And and he's hanging out at Matthew's house with all these sinners. And he's hanging with prostitutes. There's even some evidence he was drinking with them. And John's just like wondering, like, did I miss it? He hasn't left the faith. He's just wondering because they didn't have a completed canon of scripture. They didn't have great preaching and teaching. They had to follow Jesus by faith. So he's wondering, is he the real deal? Is he the one? This one that's feasting and drinking and eating with sinners, is he the real deal? So John would tell the disciples, hey, go to this Jesus and ask him a question. Ask him if he's the Messiah or should I be looking for somebody else? Because I'm desperately trying to understand why he doesn't fast like we do and he hangs out with people we don't hang out with and he he does things that we don't do. 
And he loves people that we don't love. And so John's disciples come to Jesus and they ask him a question. They said, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples, they don't fast? Jesus answered, how can the guest of the bridegroom mourn while he is still with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm here with them. We're in a season of celebration. This is not the season of mourning. You got to know what season you're in. There is a time to mourn, but there's a time to dance. There is a time to die, but there's also a time to birth something new. Ecclesiastes 3. This is what it says, and we're going we're to do Matthew's account. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told them. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, now, first of all, you got to understand how radical this was. Okay? Jewish people, their custom was to fast every Monday and Thursday. It was Hebraic tradition, especially Pharisees. So this is a tax collector. This is a sinner. Jesus comes up and says, follow me. Matthew becomes a disciple. We're in his gospel. He decides to have a party at his house and invite all his sinful friends. But he has the party on a day that they're supposed to be fasting. Could you imagine how upset the religious establishment was over that? Oh, I just can't believe. <laughs> I've dealt with that my whole life. I thought I'd get through it and never have to deal with it again, but I guess I'm always going to have to deal with that religious spirit, Bishop. But he does something radical. He, he has this party on a night where they're supposed to be fasting. And I mean, they're drinking and he invites Jesus and Jesus went. But imagine the logic here. Matthew gets a touch from God and instead of going under religious rules, he wants all his friends and the sinners that he knows to get that same touch. Imagine what would happen in our churches if we went after the sinners like Matthew did and we actually hung out with them. And he says, I'm gonna have this party and I'm gonna invite Jesus to the party. Some of you need to invite Jesus to your party. When the Pharisees saw this, they said, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And let me say prophetically, this church was not built for the righteous, it was built for sinners. It was built for this community. While he was saying this, while he was saying this, a synagogue leader this is Jairus, came, different translation than the one you read, but he came and said, hey, my daughter's dying. And on his way there, the woman with the issue of blood. But understand, when you need a miracle, if you'll love a sinner and you'll reach people who are struggling, you're putting a miracle on layaway. 
When you're into evangelism and helping people who are in the struggle, when you need a miracle, God will bless you with one. And let me tell you this, when you extend grace to someone who's failed, you putting grace on layaway for you. Bishop Bronner taught me that. He said, you give so much grace, when you need it one day, you're gonna get it. What does this mean, this new wine? How, how do we get it? Well, we gotta quit holding on to the past. We've gotta stop hindering the present move of God by holding on to the past. Uh, let me ask you this, how does the church grow? I'll wait for your answer. How does the church grow? Does it grow because of cool LED screens? Does it grow because you have the greatest worship, which we do, but does it grow because of that? No. Does it grow because you have great preaching? No. You know how a church grows? When the body gets so in love with Jesus Christ and the mission he called them to, that it starts oozing up from their pores. And when they leave this place, they start loving people and helping the less fortunate and inviting people. And when the wine is flowing so much at this altar that people come from all around to get in on it. I had someone recently, we're just gonna call him Serpent Tongue. He's been giving me hell for a long time. His big gripe was that the choir wouldn't grow. So after about five years of that hell, I asked Rashonda, hey, how many rehearsals has this guy been to in the last year? She said nine, and he left early twice. I asked her in late August, they practice every week. I said, how many guests has he brought to the choir, Rashonda? None. You might have someone in your church pastor say, why isn't the church growing? If they ask you that, ask them, how many people you led to Jesus this week? I haven't seen you bring a guest in 10 years. No, don't shout me down while I'm preaching good. How does the kingdom advance? How does the new wine come? How does something in the church grow? It grows by inviting and investing. You're never going to get a harvest if you don't invest in people, Joe. If you don't love people, you're not going to get a harvest in the kingdom of God. If you're, if you're not willing to invest and invite and to sow your time into someone, you're not gonna get a harvest. Wine is joy and revelation from God. It's also the rhema word or the spoken word. It can mean that in the word of God. It can come at an expected or unexpected time. Wine, the new wine of the Holy Ghost is often uh, experienced in unusual methods. What happened last night was an outpouring, an outpouring that we hadn't experienced since the week before the COVID lockdown. And I'm just getting real tonight. I hope I make the devil mad and the religious spirit stirred up. I love stirring up religious spirits. But in the week before we had the lockdown, my father remember this. Had a very gifted person on staff, but he wasn't Holy Ghost filled. And that night his wife got Holy Ghost filled. And he rushed her out of here immediately. He was embarrassed of it. We had Dr. Williams here from North Cleveland Church of God. He laid hands on our staff. We waded into the altar just like last night. And we were on the verge of something and then this lockdown. And last night was the first time I felt us come together since 2019 like in the spiritual realm. But this problem that Jesus revealed, he, he, he 
he speaks of this wine and wine skin, as I said, it was animal skin. And you couldn't put the new wine in, in, the, in the old wine skin. And what is an old wine skin? It, it's a, the container that's been stretched out too far. You see, some of us have stretched out yesterday too far. Our friend, John Kilpatrick, he, he, he told us, you know, revival happened in Brownsville. It was legit. But you know what John Kilpatrick told me and my father? That what killed the revival was they made Walmart out of it. They started manufacturing what God did originally in Brownsville. They thought they had to have church every night to call it a revival. And eventually it died. It became religious. It became everything that it wasn't when it started. And what happens with a religious spirit is we try to replicate what happened yesterday. We try to go back to what God did 10 years ago, five months ago. God's doing a new thing. He told Moses, look, I'm moving so fast you can't even see my hind parts. God is always moving ahead. He's not looking back. He's moving ahead. We've got to get in on what God's doing. But new wine must be put into new wine skins. And no one after drinking old wine wishes for new. The old is good enough, they'll say. Jesus says to his disciples, listen, quit focusing on my behavior and the sinners I'm running with. Quit focusing on the fact that I don't fit in with your religious tradition and start looking at my fruit. The blind see, the lame walk, people are being healed and delivered from demons. Look at the fruit. See, a religious person can't see the fruit. He goes on to say, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. How do you recognize fruit in a pastor? Do they win souls? Do they lead people to Christ? Do they serve people? Do they advance kingdom? Ask yourself that question. It's not that complicated. It's fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. So we can't put new wine into an old wine skin. Can't happen. What could be an old wine skin? Well, it could be a number of things. It, it, it could be your culture. Just because something's your culture doesn't mean it's kingdom. That's right. I, I'll be honest, I was raised Baptist. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, evidence speaking in tongues, all that stuff. I'm a, I, I'm a Holy Ghost guy, but I still have a tendency to be Baptist on stuff. I still like my points. I do. My wife likes my points. Even these are good. I mean, you got to be honest. I'm good at outlining a passage of Scripture. Come on now. A prophecy has been released. A problem has been revealed. Yes, Amen. I know what I'm doing. I have a tendency to go back to my roots. You have a tendency to go back to your roots. So we all have a tendency to think our way and the way we were raised is the right way. There ain't no right way unless it's God's way. I like to preach 45 minutes. That's me. That's my culture. Jesus did it in 18 minutes and changed the world with his Sermon on the Mount. He did. Some of the greatest things he did took a few minutes. Didn't take as long as we labor in something. We have to understand that God always is in the new thing. Amen? It's not about our tradition or our culture. It's about the kingdom. It's about the kingdom. A prophecy released, a problem revealed, but a promise that must be received. There's a promise before you leave tonight that must be received. 2023 and 24 will be a year of vindication that leads to victory. It will be a year of new wine, new joy, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. 2024 will be a season of favor and retribution for God's people. He will do a new thing. 
with his ecclesia. Prayers will be answered. <clears throat> Favor will come. Somebody say amen. amen. As I said, during the fall of next year or even this year, you might find yourself tempted to rejoice in the fall of those who hurt you. Do not, do not take the bait of Satan. Be gracious towards the people who are facing consequences for their action. God has more revelation for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. He has made heavenly resources and encounters available to you. Somebody receive this in the Holy Ghost. Don't look at me, look to the kingdom right now. There's heavenly resources and encounters available to you just around the corner. But you, my friend, must desire them, seek them out, expect them, believe on them, and walk this thing out. The old wineskin of past religion won't do. God's not gonna pour his spirit out the way he did yesterday, 10 years ago, 50 years ago, or 60 years ago. That day's done. New wine's coming. Now, if you don't want the new wine and the old is good enough for you, that's your choice. That's your decision. But don't poison the new wine that God's about to burst forth here or anywhere else. If you're watching from out of town, if you're stuck in your old pharisaical mindset, don't poison other people that want to go to the next level. Y'all give me 10 more minutes. Y'all give me 10 more minutes. National Institute of Behavioral Health talked about five ways people respond to change. People hate change. And just like when Jesus started hanging out with sinners and hanging out at Matthew's house when they were supposed to be fasting, hanging out with prostitutes and doing everything in a different way, talking about the kingdom and everybody thought it was just Israel and Jesus is talking about this crazy message about the kingdom of heaven being at hand. People hate change and how do people respond to change? They ask questions. Nothing wrong with questions unless they're rebellious questions. Some people don't ask questions to learn, they ask questions to confuse and distract and divide. And you have to, Pastor Bill, I just anoint you with the ability to see the difference. Some questions aren't a lack of knowledge, they're demonic. But this is what the National Institute of Behavioral Health said about how people respond to change. 3%. A whopping 3% when a change is made, everybody say three, three, are what they call early innovators. In other words, and I've implemented plenty of changes the last six years, and this statistic shocked me, that when you innovate and you make a change or you declare a new vision or a new thing, that initially you're only gonna have 3% of people on board with your vision. Now, looking back six years, I see it now. Thank God I didn't see it then. I'd have been like Elijah and went into a full-flown depression probably. 3%, they're what they call early innovators. I'm gonna call them radicals. Everybody say radicals. 13% are what they call early adapters. These people aren't rebellious. It just takes them a little longer to get on board. I'm gonna call them the remnant. Everybody say remnant. So a whopping 16% of most people, when a change is made, are gonna go along with it peaceably and supportively. 34% are what they call bandwagon followers. I'll call them reverent. Not rebellious, just hey, we don't want to mess up anything or we don't want to be called rebellious, so we're just going to go along with that 16% to try not to rock the boat. So now we're at 50%. But then there's 34%, and I call them the watch and wait followers. And see, when they voted on me as pastor, Bishop Ote, I, it was 2017. We did everything in five year elders. We did all that stuff. And it was unanimous. I still got the video. Everybody's standing up. <laughs> you know? And I thought, man, Kelly, they're with me, man. Glory. You know? 
And I realized now, a lot of them weren't. They wanted to watch and wait. And some of them, when I didn't fail, and when God started blessing me, it really stirred up their collar. And so you have the watch and wait followers. I'll call them the reluctant. So now we're at 84%. Then you have 16%. These are the antagonistic resistors. That's what the Behavioral Institute calls them. I'm going to call them rebellious. That's an old Bible term. Because it says rebellion is as of the sin of witchcraft. What I've been dealing with lately is I've got the reverent, the 34% reverent. They're friends with the reluctant and the rebellious. And so what I see happening is the rebellious are influencing the reluctant and the reverent. And it's bringing confusion. Well, who's the author of confusion? It's the devil is the author of confusion. That's why it's important whose voice you listen to. It's important who you walk with. It's important who you talk to. It's important who you covenant with. We must be prepared for the new wine. Do not remember the former things. Nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Would you stand on your feet with me and let me prophesy to you? It's time, just lift your hands up. It's time to release your past. Listen, I'm talking about ministry, but this isn't just ministry. You have pain from your past and you've, you're bitter. You haven't forgiven the people that have hurt you. It's time to release your past. In Genesis 26, Isaac was on a mission of discovery. His servants discovered some new wells of water in the land, but the locals contended with them. Isaac could have camped there in the land of dispute and dysfunction. He could have continued to camp in the land of dispute, defending his rights, but he chose to move on from the past and move ahead to new wells. Some of you need to move ahead to new wells and receive the new wine of the Spirit. Forgive and bless those who have hurt you. Ask forgiveness in the areas you need forgiveness. Be released from the unkindness of those who have not believed in you or have hindered you. This will be a year of turning points, a moment or season in time when change takes place, one that leads to new and greater things. You may feel as if you've been turning but not making progress. You're about to shift into a new level of progress. You remember what he told the children of Israel, you've circled this mountain long enough. 38 years is long enough. Can I get an amen? amen. It's time to go all in in the kingdom of God for the spirit of God. The Lord himself is ending the lies, the deception, the confusion, the thievery, the pride, the religious arrogance, the mocking, the scoffing, the evil in places of authority in this nation. Watch and see in the next 12 months that the Lord himself will bring out of this awakening a shift for you, the nation of Israel, the United States of America. Things are about to shift. People are going to come together and we're on the verge of a great awakening, a kingdom awakening. Dry bone religion won't do. Yesterday's church won't do it. We've got to move ahead in the kingdom of God. The grace of God is bringing us into a new level of maturity. That's what number seven is. It's completion. It also means perfection and maturity. God's grace. People think grace is a cheap doctrine. No, it's a doctrine for the mature. God's grace is bringing us into a new level of maturity recreating us into his image, not our own. 
separating us from dry bone religion, the past, and bringing about a new beginning that will be released, check this out, by signs, wonders, miracles, and the gifts of the Spirit. Abba's house, you will arise, for your time of favor is here. Yes, the set time has come. Receive the new wine of the anointing from Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, Alpha, Omega, beginning, end, comforter, deliverer, everlasting Father, the great I am the king of my heart, the one who saved my soul, chased me into a bar room, rescued my life, put a new ring on my finger and robe on my back and sandals on my feet. He is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be praised.